I'm Bill Castle, and this is Free Expression. This program is all about conveying the Christian message from a Catholic point of view and defending the liberty which makes it possible to do that. We talk with creative, interesting people about the influence of various saints on history and how philanthropy has become an ideological tool. Join us, sit back, and enjoy some free expression. Large-scale charitable giving has a long pedigree in America, especially among the super-rich. Throughout our history, great captains of industry, people like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller, have dedicated large chunks of their fortunes to building schools, libraries, hospitals, institutions that have provided inestimable service to society. The charitable urge is still present, but something seems to have changed. Today, the leading moguls of finance, entertainment, high technology tend to use their philanthropy less to serve society than to change it. Ideology guides their giving. Hayden Ludwig has examined modern giving patterns. He's director of policy research for Restoration of America, an organization that analyzes the challenges our nation is facing right now. In a recent article, he contrasted the motives of past philanthropists with today's major donors. His insights into the differences are something people of faith should consider. Hayden, thanks so much for being with us. Bill, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Industry leaders of the past could hardly be called saints. In fact, many were quite ruthless, often referred to as robber barons. But it does seem that they acted on some kind of Christian impetus. Today's philanthropy is so politically charged. What's motivating the big donors now? People are familiar with, say, John D. Rockefeller the first, right, the oil tycoon, who was a pretty devout Baptist, and he was a big believer in charity long before he was a multimillionaire, a very rich man. And those people grew up in a Christian culture where biblical thinking suffused every part of American life. But unfortunately, you flash forward to today, and many of the richest billionaires, especially the ones coming out of Silicon Valley, They share no such beliefs because we live, unfortunately, in an increasingly post-Christian culture. So we wrote about one in particular named Reid Hoffman, the founder of the company LinkedIn, and how he uses his quote-unquote charitable giving to do hyper-political partisan work that really helps elect Democrats and make left-wing policy, but it uses the same kinds of tax-exempt groups created a century ago to do real, genuine Christian charity. What's what's in it for, for people like that? I mean, it, it seems that they have achieved tremendous success within a capitalist environment, within an environment of entrepreneurial freedom, and yet somehow they don't seem committed to that as, as a way to organize society. You know, it's a great question, and I often wonder about how do you get in their heads, too. But the best analysis that I can think of is that this really, this kind of social justice ideology, quote-unquote progressive ideology, really is their religion. So if you think about it, it mirrors Christianity. They, they have a concept of some kind of sin, it's not biblical sin, but, you know, things like, quote, white supremacy, as they always point out, or racism. And they have a kind of atonement. If you give all of this money, you can, you know, be virtuous. You can be, well, maybe not quite forgiven, because there really is no forgiveness or mercy in progressive ideology. But it taps into the same kinds of motivators that we would expect to find in a Christian civilization like the United States is. But because this is all secular, militantly secular at that, it goes into politics, because the left can't really conceive of actual philanthropy. We know, of course, that the word philanthropy comes from the Greek words meaning to love your neighbor, as our Lord commanded us to. Well, there really is no love, just as there's no forgiveness, in militant secularism. That's why they move this kind of money into causes like Black Lives Matter, which, you know, they they take a lot of cues from the Christian mode of thinking about loving your neighbor, of course, but they're not Christian. They're anti-Christian. 
I think it's ironic that they use these kinds of nonprofit groups that were created by Congress in order to reflect our country's Christian heritage, but they really aren't using them for the same reason they were created. They're taking advantage of the kind of generosity that sparked things like uh, tax deductibility for donations to your local church, for instance. It's a weaponization of philanthropy. And it seems to run the risk of of sacrificing their own business interests, uh, certainly the alienating their customers. We see things like the the Bud Light fiasco of a few, of a few months back, where a major brand that had been an icon in the of of the beer industry uh, faded into obscurity because of a huge reaction from the public. And that was a great victory for those of us who push back against the woke culture. Yeah, I, str- I truly believe that this will this has a shelf life, and this kind of ideological business strategy that you're finding in companies like LinkedIn or Amazon or Google or Disney these days, it cannot last forever because something that cannot go on forever just can't go on forever, right? But the reason it won't is because they've been using bully tactics to get their way for a long time. So we've seen this with the cancel culture that's been prevalent in the United States for at least a decade, pretty much since Obama took office back in 2009. Being able to shut down all debate and cancel your political opponents or people who think culturally or religiously different from you has served the left very well, and it's made them fabulously wealthy because they've managed to get so many CEOs of major corporations on board. But the public is tired of that. They are sick of tired of being told that they, their basic beliefs are no longer compatible with the American way of life, even though we believe things that people have believed for thousands of years, like marriages between one man and one woman. That comes straight from the Word of God. We know these things to be true. And ultimately, this stuff is dying out, and I believe because it's so radical, it will be its own undoing. In the case of well-established families like, say, the Rockefeller clan, people who have been involved in charity over the course of generations, is guilt a factor if, you know, if, if the original uh, fortune-building generation began these charities to the younger generations, the people who didn't build the company but who inherited their wealth, are, are they burdened by some measure of guilt? Well, I think undoubtedly they are. As Christians, we're informed by this kind of thinking that all mankind is under, you know, the guilt of original sin. So certainly I think that's true, but I don't think they're mostly aware of it. I think for them, a lot of what motivates this, uh, maybe on a a lower level than the, the, the philosophy here, the theology here, is that there's a love of money that taints a lot of their thinking. So a lot of these billionaires you know, they're less like individual citizens of a country than they are like aircraft carriers. <laughs> you know, people flying in and out, giving them information, taking information. You know, they're like small microstates in and of themselves. And I've often thought when you study, for instance, Bill Gates, this fabulously wealthy man who has more money than he could reasonably spend in multiple lifetimes, what does that kind of wealth do to a mind that hasn't been tempered by Christian thinking? Well, it means you're not going to have any humility. You're not going to have any sense of serving your neighbor, but you do have a strong sense of legacy. Then I think with this kind of militant secularism that manifests itself in a kind of person who thinks, well, I'm like a demigod. I'm a god myself. I can do these amazing things like save a country from a COVID pandemic or transform abortion access across Africa and the developing world. And that their money really reflects this kind of thinking. And that that thinking is really kind of shallow in some ways, because even, for instance, as as we saw in all of the advocacy around COVID and the and the vaccines and all of that, it was there was very very poorly formed information, and yet some of these huge givers jumped so enthusiastically on that bandwagon. Yes, that's exactly right. And you know this this has been going on a lot longer than the tech billionaires that we've all been paying attention to in the last decade or so. You mentioned the Rockefellers. Well, if you go back to the 1940s and 50s, most people aren't aware of John D. Rockefeller III. So this would be the grandson of the the devout Baptist I mentioned earlier. John D. Rockefeller III was one of the most prolific funders of the population control movement. Right. He founded a group called Population Council, whose entire job was to depopulate the developing world. 
In modern terms, I think that's a pretty clear case of not wanting non-white people to reproduce. Well, that's exactly what these people believed, and they put millions of dollars, today it would be equivalent of billions of dollars, into these kinds of schemes. My favorite example, I use this term darkly, is how the Population Council, with funding from the Rockefellers and the Ford Foundation, poured money into pushing India's government in the 1960s to conduct these massive sterilization campaigns where they would surround these poor villages in rural India and they would they would force the men to have vasectomies in order to satisfy this ideology that said human beings are evil, not sinful, just pure evil <laughs> and should not be allowed to reproduce. That is the legacy of this kind of secular philanthropy and we're seeing it today with what the kind of things that the Gates Foundation funds overseas when it comes to unlimited abortion. Right, and now we're seeing that sort of thinking really being carried out on a global scale. It, it strikes me as particularly interesting that people like Bill Gates have gotten so much behind the so-called Great Reset, where they're looking to transform the world's economy. That seems kind of self-defeating. I mean, people get rich by having products or services that they can offer to others and People were willing to give them their money, but if you transform the economy and, and you reduce the wherewithal of, of your market, you're not going to get much money. Well, that's right. I think that's one of those fundamental reasons why this ideology's heyday is rapidly coming to a close. I mean, right now, in certain circles like the World Economic Forum or the Davos meetings, it's popular to say we have too many people on the planet. But, you know, in five to ten years from now, um, we're going to see some serious contractions in the global demographics where there's going to be probably fewer people alive today in 20 years than there, than there are today. And that has to do a lot with industrialization that's been going on since the 1940s. It's kind of out of people's control. And it's going to be pretty foolish for the political party that's saying we think there are too many people on the earth when, in fact, it's pretty clear to everybody that we need more human beings. We need a flourishing of life hmm. on this planet, if nothing else, to sustain a modern economy. Of course, as Christians, we celebrate life, and we should know that these people are a cult of death. And these things simply cannot go on because we know Christ is Lord of this entire planet and every nation on this planet, and he will only allow this kind of evil to flourish for so long before he stamps it out. I think that kind of stamping out is going to come much faster and much sooner than anybody can anticipate. Is this class of mega donors a mission field? Is there anything that the churches can do to reach out to these people? It's a great question. Well, obviously, they always need to hear the gospel. That is, that is certainly true. Um, I think one of the big problems right now is that the church isn't doing enough internal policing. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a Roman Catholic. I, come, I go to a Reformed Presbyterian church, sure. and I can tell you right now it's the same problem in Roman Catholicism as it is in Protestantism. There are so many, we would say, evangelicals who are no longer conservative. They don't believe any of the fundamentals of the faith or basic orthodoxies that our churches would have in common. And yet they're still pretending to be orthodox, believing Christians. And I think a lot of the reason is, is that the, the pastors and the priests behind the pulpit have gotten too cowardly to speak the truth. If you go back in this country's history, the greatest periods of expansion of the faith have always taken place right after our ministers have gotten serious about preaching the word. That was true right before the American Revolution. It was true around the time of the Civil War. And I think that's probably going to happen again um, in the near future, though God knows when. You know, as long as this kind of liberalism is allowed to corrupt and, and rot the church's foundations, we cannot expect that the only people who have the truth, the people of God, can actually do anything or have any faith or power to move these mountains that we have to move. So it's no wonder to me that the world looks so dark as it is when the church is so cowardly. Yeah, I guess we have to get our own houses in order before we can do much outreach. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about uh, Restoration of America. What's your organization do? Yeah, no, I'm happy to. So Restoration of America was founded back in 2015 by Doug Truax, who's from Illinois. He briefly ran for the Republican Senate nomination in 2014. Didn't make that, but he ended up turning what he learned into a national organization. But we don't really want to be a national organization. We want to be an organization operating in the states. So I happen to live um, just outside Richmond, Virginia, one of the battleground states where this kind of cultural fighting between the people who believe the truth and the people who believe the woke lies is going on right now. 
one of the things that my, my organization wants to do through Restoration News, which I head, is get out the truth about people like Reed Hoffman. You know, everybody has a LinkedIn account, if you're, especially if you're a young professional. We use these people's services all of the time, but do we ask ourselves, what is the money that we're spending, that we're lining our pockets with, what is it achieving? And sometimes there's no alternative, but sometimes conservatives need to go out and create that alternative so that we have our own marketplace. We can go to places where we're not paying the people who hate us and hate everything we believe in to spend their money on political advocacy. So that's one of the things we're trying to accomplish, um, really trying to change people's minds, you know, and do it in a Christian context. We look at this land and we see that it is filled with rampant lawlessness and is run by people who hate the truth. And we want to point out that there is objective truth, that there really is a God who reigns over all of this. And we want to remind people that the left offers no future. It, it cannot tell you anything good about the future. It can only tell you the climate is getting hotter, we're all going to die, and we're going to have miserable, <laughs> poorer lives in the future. <laughs> and I don't believe that's true. <laughs> well, where can people go to find out more or to connect with you, perhaps participate in your activities? Well, you can go to our website, www.restoration-news. That's restoration-news.com. You can read all of our stuff. We post daily. And not just on this, we cover a lot about dark money, how the left is corrupting our energy and environmental policy, gun control laws. We like to expose every aspect of the left. And you can find our stuff on social media, too. We're on Twitter or on Facebook, all of the major, major social media platforms. And we are going to be running a series of political ads in the 2024 cycle. So keep an eye out for those. Hayden Ludwig, Restoration of America. Thanks a lot for being with us. Uh, You guys are doing some interesting work, and it's good to have people know about it. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate all you're doing. It's said that the Lord moves in mysterious ways, and one of the most mysterious is how he finds the right individuals to accomplish his will from among the mass of us flawed, fallible human beings. Those special people we call saints, and the history of the church has been marked by unique characters who've appeared on the scene just when some problem had to be addressed, some great change needed to be made. Often a particular saint seems born to play a special role, but others aren't necessarily marked for greatness, at least not at the beginning. They gain strength as they respond to God's call. Attorney Randy Petritus has written a book that examines the impact of certain holy individuals. It's titled, How the Saints Shaped History, and it's from Our Sunday Visitor Press. Randy, thanks for being with us. A pleasure to be with you, Bill. The saints loom large in Catholic religious tradition, but often we don't know much about them. You've provided a helpful overview of nearly 200 key figures, and perhaps more important, you've set them in their historical context so we can appreciate their importance over time. Tell us about how you conceived and organized this book. Well, it started out as uh, a pure history uh, with saints sprinkled in, because when I... uh, began to write this book, I wanted to approach history with uh, the the eyes of faith and to see what the Holy Spirit did. And the more I got into it, the more I realized that if you want to see the footprint, so to speak, of the Holy Spirit, you look for those people who are most open to His grace and are most committed to being disciples, and that would be the saints. And I thought, wait a minute, that really hasn't been done before quite just like that. There are many great history books, many great saint books, but I uh, decided maybe I could try to find a niche in approaching this by putting the two together. So that's how it kind of came to be. It evolved from history to seeing that the saints were the ones who really were at the thick of the uh, spiritual history of the church. Who were some of the people you focused on? I tended 
to go to the saints that were more well known, with with a number of exceptions. I wasn't trying to uh, dig out uh, some obscure statements. Almost by the uh, nature of what I was doing, the saints who were well known are the ones who were making the history, mm. and and we could go go back and see it. So even from the biblical saints like Saint Paul, who may be one of the MVPs of all time to St. Athanasius, who is the MVP of the uh, a battle against uh, the Arian heresy, to St. Arrhenius of Lyon, who had a tremendous impact on both scripture and in f- forming the theological foundations for the, for the church going forward, to, I mean, I could go on throughout all of history, Augustine and Ambrose, and uh, on into the future here. But So I was just looking at each era of the church, and uh, who was it that was front and center in the, the teeth of the battles and of the issues of the day, and it was the, these various 180 or so saints. What makes a saint? What do you think prepares someone to step into a role of, of being God's tool, if you will? First and foremost, it's the Holy Spirit. Uh, the same Holy Spirit that's uh, uh, available to all of us will open ourselves up, up to Him. And uh, it's an openness to grace. And as uh, we hear so often from the great preachers of our day, uh, we're all called to be saints. And that is so true. And it's not like there's this dividing line, okay, you're on the wrong side of the, you're not, you're below the level of saints. And then th- these great holy people are above the level. We're all called to be saints. And if we're following the Lord, in a, a real sense we are. But as, as far as the canonized saints, I think they had a particular openness to the grace of the Holy Spirit. And also, providentially, God calls people. He, he doesn't necessarily... Uh, he calls them to a task more than holiness. Holiness is a response to God's grace. But he does call people to a task, and that's how we got to know these saints who were so instrumental in, in their history. And another thing I would add, which was kind of a surprise discovery as I went through the writing of this book, and that is that there are a lot of people in the lives of the saints who, by the grace of God, encouraged them, helped them, supported them, picked them up, and pushed them on their way. I mean, people like St. Monica who uh, chased St. Augustine all over the Mediterranean until he converted, <laughs> and uh, St. Macrina, who uh, got a hold of her younger brother, uh, St. Basil the Great, and basically said, don't throw your life away on a secular career, give your life to the Lord, and he listened to her, and you know, people like that, too, were part of making these great saints throughout history. Yeah, it's, some saints started out as, as pretty notorious characters or <laughs> unsavory individuals, and their lives somehow underwent a profound change. The one who I discovered was probably the most notorious deep into uh, his life, who a lot of times they, the, the notorious past of the saints was before they really had an impact on the world. But St. Vladimir of Kiev. Uh, was one saint who was a king, and he was a bad king, and he was, you know, murdered his brother and uh, was attacking the people around him, and uh, so he was established as a genuine bad guy, and then he had his conversion. So, so he was probably the most, say maybe Saint Paul was another one who was like that too, was established as a bad guy before his conversion. But yes, that is true. A lot of them had to undergo conversion. In most instances, it was before they had an impact on the world, or in a few instances like I just mentioned, those who already had a negative impact on the world before they were called to, to serve in the kingdom. The saints that uh, stand out most probably are, are the ones who, who weren't recognized automatically, who, who were even resisted. Saints like St. Saint Francis or uh, St. Teresa of Avila, who actually stood up against the complacency that had taken hold in the church, or even the corruption that had, that had come about. And they weren't necessarily welcomed with open arms and, and thought of saints right at the, at the start. That is true, and uh, I think it's their perseverance, which comes from their deep prayer lives that they had, where, where they could hear God say, uh, "Stay the course," uh, because a lot of a lot of us can see issues uh, that maybe we ought to attack, and maybe we don't uh, go after them. But uh, these saints who did make a difference, who had to fight through. Uh, many obstacles. Uh, if you point to one characteristic that, uh, uh, or maybe two, one was a deep prayer life to, to let God lead them, and the other was just simply perseverance. 
Now, one of the features of your book that I find interesting is the timeline. You you have a visual representation showing where the saints fit into the historical pattern. Yes, and you know, Bill, as I uh, uh, stand here today talking to you, I can't draw a stick man. Uh, so I have <laughs> the uh, wonderful uh, designers at our Sunday visitor to thank for that. I gave them a uh, chart with uh, saints in historical events to work with, and they turned it into this beautifully illustrated timeline. So I want to give all the credit in the world to, to those folks there. First of all, for seeing, I, I didn't even think of that when I submitted my manuscript but they said, you know, this might work, and it did. And I've gotten a lot of compliments on it, and I have to deflect it right over to them because they're the ones who put that great timeline together. Well, where can people find out more about the book or maybe even purchase it? It's on the normal sources of places like Amazon, and it's in a lot of Catholic bookstores. But our Sunday visitor, CatholicBookstore.com, is a very good place to get it. It's free shipping, and they're very fast and efficient. And so it would be OSV, CatholicBookstore.com. How the Saints Shaped History, Randall Petritus. Thanks a lot, Randy, for being with us. It's a great book. It's much needed, and I'm sure it will help a lot of people who wish to know more about this aspect of the Church's history. Thank you so much for having me, Bill. If you've been listening to these shows online but would like to hear them on the radio, tell your local Catholic station. Free Expression with Bill Castle is available for broadcast free of charge. Ask your Catholic station to contact us by email, billcastle at sbcglobal.net. That's B-I-L-L-K-A-S-S-E-L, all one word, Bill Castle at sbcglobal.net. And don't forget to support your local station. In this time of censorship and so-called cancel culture, Catholic radio is becoming increasingly important as an alternative media source. Our programming is based on the Word of God and the teaching of His Church, and we bring you the factual, truthful information you aren't getting from the mainstream media. Support Catholic Radio. Your generosity keeps Catholic outlets on the air, and donations to broadcast ministries can be tax-deductible. Urge your friends and relatives to tune in as well. Be with us next time when we explore other aspects of religious communication and look deeper into the great Christian heritage of free expression. Free Expression with Bill Castle is a production of Good Shepherd Catholic Radio and company publications where good books, good music, and good radio are always good company. Dan Curris provided technical assistance. Theme and incidental music are by Dan Adam. The program was produced and directed by Bill Castle. This is Good Shepherd Catholic Radio.